Peter, chapter number five with me this morning, please. I love first and second Peter, folks. Peter the Apostle. Simon Peter. First Peter chapter number five and verse number six. Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Father, bless your holy word now, Lord. Bless this holy book and bless this messenger. In thy name I pray. Amen. You folks can be seated. When the Apostle Peter wrote this book, Nero, one of the worst monsters that ever lived, is persecuting Jews and Christians, set uh, Rome afire and blamed them for it, wound up committing suicide by his own hand. Nero was a madman, but he was also persecuting Christians. And the Apostle Peter writes to them, these Christians, he said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that shall try you. Many times down through the years, even to this day, Christians have suffered martyrdom, persecution, suffering right now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. America has been spared for the most part from the kind of suffering and persecution that our brothers and sisters are enduring at this very moment around the world. The Apostle Peter addresses this. He's talking to people like this right here in 1 Peter chapter 5. He's not talking to a to, a, to, a, to an affluent country where you have all the power and authority and everything goes your way. He's talking to people that have been persecuted. They're suffering people. And so how does he comfort them? He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Be reminded of God's sovereignty, in other words. He's the Lord. There's nothing beside him. He makes no mistakes. God is God. We didn't make God. God made us. We don't make him Lord. He is Lord. We just acknowledge that lordship, that he is the Lord. But I want you to notice the nature of the battle. If you look at it carefully, verse number 8, he said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he, na he may devour. Now, my dear friend, this has to do with your spiritual walk with God. Note carefully, we're not talking about unsaved people in 1 Peter 5. This is not addressed to the unsaved world. This is addressed to Christians, your brothers and your sisters in Christ who lived 2,000 years ago. You'll see them one day. You'll see all the martyrs. You'll see all the saints of God. And my, my dear friend, it'll be by the tens and hundreds of millions as you gather around the throne of God. So the nature of the battle to be found in verse number 8, your, devil, your adversary the devil seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. The word in the Greek word for that literally means to swallow you up. He wants to do you in. If you've ever watched any of these documentaries of Africa and places like that, where the African lion roams, you'll see that he is a he is a carnivore. He's a killer. He searches out his prey and he finds his prey in a in a in a in a, in a moment when uh, you know he's vulnerable, and then he pounces upon his prey. And it's whatever it is, and he'll eat about anything, I suppose. And he'll pounce upon that prey, and that lion will kill it, and he'll eat it. This is exactly the uh, the the analogy that Paul gives, or Peter gives here, because two thousand years ago in Israel they had lions roaming. Lions were roaming in this country. We know that from archaeology. Their bones have been dug up. No question about it. The lion roamed in this area. This is why. A shepherd had such a job as Peter, as, as, as David talked about. He said, I dealt with a lion, the wolf, the bear, whatever it was. He said, I was responsible to take care of my flock. And so he did. He learned the, le he learned the lessons of battle out there dealing with the enemies like that. So you've got to understand the nature of the battle. For example, we went in, in, in France, they went through the great uh, the rebellion, and it's called the time of terror, the reign of terror. Then they established the French Republic, and it wasn't too many years after that that Napoleon rose up. And Napoleon began to establish an empire. He wanted an empire. All over the world, the French Empire would go out. And my dear friends, they did spread their tentacles out into a lot of places. There are areas now that are, cut, that are, that are controlled by the French, the French government. 
But Napoleon was stopped at the Battle of Waterloo on land, and he was stopped at the Battle of Trafalgar on the sea. Admiral Nelson stopped him. So he was stopped on land and he was stopped on sea. And my dear friend, the battle sometimes is not where you want to fight it. It's where the devil chooses to fight it. And you need a Horatio Nelson. You need a man that will stand up with one arm shot off and he gets shot and he still leads his people until he dies right there on that ship. He inspires them. His courage inspires people. Let me tell you something, folks. I, I respect courage wherever I see it. Amen. Amen. Once, you, once you see courage, it will inspire you. Cowardice, what does that do for you? This coward, the cowardly politicians that you live in this country with, what does it do for you? Does it inspire you or does it turn your stomach? Amen. And so this, my dear friend, is the nature of the battle. It can be fought at sea. The nature of the battle can be fought in the mountains. For example, Greece and Italy in World War II, they fought battles in the mountains and other places. It can be fought in the desert. A desert place. You're my, sometimes your life is in a desert place. You're going through a place where everything goes, falls apart around you. Can't make any sense of any of it. And you come down probably to the last morsel of bread you've got in the house. And there was a German general in World War II who was called the Desert Fox, Rommel. And he, he ran them wild all over Africa. And he did it with less troops and less equipment and, and armor and all of that. And my dear friend, that's the way the devil is. He'll come after you in the desert. And the battle may be fought there. The battle can be fought in the cities. In World War II in Warsaw, Poland, they went from house to house, house to house. And my dear friend, read about it. Read about Warsaw, Poland. Read about those Jews. And read about their courage as they fought off the Nazi German army. And it'll inspire you. You, my dear friend, may be fighting a battle with all the armor. You've got all the armor you can imagine. That was the battle in Russia. The largest tank battle ever fought on this earth was fought in Russia between the Germans and the Russians. Amen. All the armor was there. Hitler had sent three million troops, Operation Barbarossa, into Russia. He was going to take it and he got close to Moscow but he didn't finish the job because of the Russian winter. But his armor was there. Armor against armor. Armor against armor. The Bible said put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand the devil. All the fiery darts of Satan. We know the wiles of the devil. You need to understand folks. We are in a battle. Amen. It's not a game and it's not a joke. Then there's the battle of the air. That's fought in the air. I guess one of the best uh, illustrations I could give would be the battle of Britain. When uh, Hermann Goring sent the Luftwaffe across the 20 miles straight between uh, France and, and Great Britain. He sent his, he sent his fighters in there. He sent his, he sent his airplanes in there. And the battle of Britain, these men went up in their spitfires and they fought in the sky. They prayed, they met and prayed and fought. And God delivered e e England from the, from, from, from Germany. They fought the battle of Britain. That some battles are so, so important. If the battle is not won, then my dear friend, we have a problem that develops continually and for generations. They'll pay for it. Some of you are in a battle right now for your life. You're in a battle for your spiritual life. And you're fighting and you don't know what to do. You've used up all your resources and you, you've prayed and you've done everything you can possibly do. Let me tell you what you do. Cast your care upon Him for He careth for you. Take all those problems and cast them on to the Lord Jesus. Say, Lord, this is too great for me. I've already tried to carry it and I can't carry it. It's beating me to death. Amen. Have you ever been in a battle like that? I fight battles all the time. Notice carefully, these are spiritual battles and these are battles that are fought in the mind. Your mind is the enemy. Your mind is the target of Satan. He comes after the mind. And the mind is a powerful thing. You may think you have your mind in control and all along your mind is just wandering here and wandering there. And my friend, let me tell you what to think. Think on these things. Whatsoever things be holy. Whatsoever things be pure. Whatsoever things be of good report. Think on these things. The Apostle Paul said. In other words, allow God's Word to give you inspiration. Think on His Word. Oh yes, the battles were fought. The battles raged. Hitler didn't give up easily either. 
He had his final battle against the Allies. And that was the Battle of the Bulge. And for a while, he was winning it. And he was pushing the Allied line back. And it formed a bulge. That Bastogne was the last stand of the, of, the, of the Allies against Hitler. He lost that battle. And when he lost that battle, my dear friend, the next thing the Russians had on their sight was Berlin. And the Germans fought hard. When they got to the capital of, of Germany, they fought from house to house. Satan does not like to give up. Once he has power over you, he does not want to give up. He wants to keep you where he can condemn you and drive you down. Some of you haven't had joy for years. You haven't had victory for years. You've let the devil beat you to death. He works on me. Satan, oh yes, he does. Oh, you preacher, I thought he didn't mess with preachers. How are you kidding me? He works me over like you wouldn't believe. Amen. And, and when, I get, when, I, when I become accustomed to one of his tactics and, and learn what it takes to deal with that tactic, you know, and plus scriptures and prayer and facing off Satan, then he'll come along with another tactic. Amen. His, his, his army, he's got everything. He's got you. He knows you. He's got every tactic in the book. And my dear friend, he's not easy to defeat. But this is where you cast your care upon him. You say, Lord Jesus, you defeated Satan at the cross. I'm turning him over to you. <laughs> Amen. And greater is he that is in you that is in the world. So get on your knees this morning after this service. You can do it right now. And come down here and say, Lord God, that preacher's telling the truth. I'm miserable. I'm beat to death. Everything's going wrong. I don't have any joy. I have no victory. Lord, help me out of this mess. And cast your care upon him. For he cares for you. That's what Paul, the Peter said here in 1 Peter chapter number 5. Notice carefully, the greatest weapon that Satan can use against you is an attack upon the character of God. In other words, the relationship that you have with God, that's your Achilles heel. If he can get that, none of the rest of it matters. If he can affect your understanding, belief, trust, and love for the character of God, there needs to be nothing else. No more, no more, no more. Well, you say, preacher, it's my sin. Satan, Satan tempted me to do this, and Satan tempted me to do that. Well, sometimes Satan certainly is the tempter, no question about it. But James says that we're led away by our own lust and enticed. That's what James said. So don't be one that blames Satan for everything. I mean, after all, we're accountable, aren't we? Yes, we are. We're accountable. Well, the devil made me do it. Well, let's, let's, that, I'm, not going to, I'm not an apologist for Satan, believe me. But you do what you want to do. You make your own choices. That's what we are. Make your own choices. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. So it's the nature of the battle. It is an assault upon God's character. Let's go back in the Bible and we'll look at one place where God's character shines true. Where's that? That's Joseph. Joseph had a coat of many colors because he was a dreamer and his father loved him. And the brethren became jealous of him. And one day they were in the field and Joseph came to them. And they said, here comes that dreamer. We'll take him and we'll kill him. Now, my dear friend, let me tell you something. Had it not been for Reuben, the firstborn, and Judah, the fourthborn, Reuben, Simon, Levi, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, if it had not been for them, they would have killed him. So we've got... Ten murderers that make up the twelve tribes of Israel. Meditate on that for a while. They wanted to kill their brother. Said, we'll kill him and then we'll go back and tell our daddy that some wild beast had destroyed him out here in the field. We'll take his coat and we'll dip it in blood. And surely our father will believe that. But Reuben was the firstborn. And Reuben intervened. Now let me tell you one of the reasons that Reuben did. Because being the firstborn, he was the beginning of the strength of Jacob. He was the one who was the, over the head of the household in a sense. He was the head of the priesthood for the home. Before they had an Aaronic priesthood, he was the one who was responsible for the spiritual condition of the home. And Reuben knew that Jacob would hold him accountable for whatever happened to his son. So what did he do? He stepped in and said, oh, wait a minute, don't do this, don't do this. He intervened to save the life of Joseph. And so my dear friend, he not only intervened to save his life, but 
But Judah also intervened. And Judah let him be sold off into slavery. Gone from the land. What a horrible thing. You say, well, a preacher, wouldn't it be awful for you to be sold into slavery? Wouldn't it be awful for you to not understand what God's doing? How can God be in some of the worst situations that can happen to a human being? It gets darker and it gets darker, preacher. It gets darker and darker. Yes, but it doesn't take much light to shine through the darkness. Not much at all. As a matter of fact, when it gets dark, that's when you can see the light. The other day I was sitting in my basement, turned all the lights out, and patched up the windows. No light could come in. And here I'm sitting in the dark, and I do that every once in a while. I do that and I meditate and talk to the Lord. And I looked up at the ceiling, roof, ceiling of my, of that, of my basement. And here's this small ray of light coming in. In other words, it's straight outside and that light is coming into the basement. No telling what bug, what this or what that could crawl through that. Into the basement. But I would never have seen it had it not been pitch dark. I haven't fixed it yet. I've got to get up there and plug that thing up. No telling what's liable to crawl in there. But there's a hole in, in the wall in my basement. And I've lived there for 14 years and didn't know it. Sometimes God turns the light out. He turns it off. He forces you to see the light. It may be so dim. It may not be discernible. But you know it's there. You see, the darkness cannot overcome the light. It doesn't matter how small it is. Darkness cannot shut it down. Aren't you glad? Thank God. Regardless of what your life goes through, amen. We don't ask for this stuff. I didn't ask to be born. None of you did. But all of a sudden we show up. Here we are. And so what we do with this precious gift that God has given us, I'll tell you what you do with it. You turn to the Lord. And you turn to Him and you ask Him to come in your life. And you ask Him to save you. You ask Him to be merciful to you and gracious to you. And so He is. But there's something revealed there in the case of Joseph. And that is this. And you all know it well. The day came when those ten boys that wanted to murder their brother stood before that brother. And my, did their conscience ever smite them. Oh, my, 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 did it smite them. I mean to tell you that there was not a day of peace from the time they turned Joseph over. Not until they stood before him. There was never any peace. It ate them up. You know what Joseph did? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's the thing about God. It may look evil. He may use evil people. Hey, man, evil circumstances, evil this, evil that. But it doesn't make any difference. He'll work it together for good. All things work together for good for those that love God, for those according, called according to His purpose. And you know what happened to these 12, these 10 killers, these 10, mur 10 murderers, along with the other two? You know what happened to them? Go to the book of Revelation and read over there and you'll find out that that New Jerusalem has 12 foundations. They're the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Not the 12 tribes of Israel. That's not your foundation. No. Your foundation, the apostles of the Lamb. But it has 12 gates. It's got 12 gates that lead into that city. And folks, believe me, Reuben, Simon, uh, Reuben Simeon, and Judah, and all of them are on those gates. The 12 tribes of Israel leading in them. What, what's that mean? Grace. 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 Grace, you murdering dogs, you deserve to be hung from the highest tree. Yet Joseph looked at him and said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So that's the nature of the battle. The nature of the battle, friend, and this is the most important part. I want to reiterate it. The nature of the battle is Satan's attack and assault upon the character of God. If he can get you to believe him, then you're finished. If you believe that God is unfair, if you believe that God does not care, if you believe that God has predestined and ordained you before the foundation of the world to burn in hell with no choice, good night, man. Ah, what a doctrine. 
If you believe that God is against you, then you have no hope. But the apostle said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Do you believe God's for you? Yes, he's for you. Do you understand what he, how he does it? The Bible said, lean not to thine own understanding. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Seek not to your own understanding. No way in the world. I want you to notice Satan's method. He's a lion on the prowl. You ever watched him? You ought to watch some of these, 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 uh, these uh, uh, documentaries. I mean, I watch everything. Good night. I watch them load ships up and send it down into the water. I watch this. I watch that. I watch them riding motorcycles, skating, scooting. I love to watch these old videos, these old photographs 100 years ago. They're colorizing a lot of them now. And you're looking at all these people that lived 100 years ago. And it's so, they, through technology, it's made it so clear. It's like you're looking at right here this morning, looking at each other. And the videos, what they've done with these people. And the women wear their big hats. They've got the long dresses. And, I mean, they're covered from, top, from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. You know, they're covered up. That's the culture. But you can learn something by watching that. And I've watched the lion. I've watched it attack its prey. And most of the time, the lion will go for the jugular. It'll go and it'll squeeze the very life out so it can't breathe. That's what it does. It goes for the throat. And it'll hold it in its, in its jaws till it can't breathe anymore. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to take hold of you. And he wants to put you in his jaws. And he wants to squeeze the very life out of you. If I were in this house this morning, Satan dragging me down, beating me to death, I'd get up and walk down here and I'd say, Lord God, he's a liar. I don't belong to Satan. I belong to you. He's a liar. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, I command thee, leave me. And he'll have to leave you if you know him. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, is a barrier he cannot cross. He wants you when you're vulnerable. Finally, the nature of the battle, Satan's method, and then our battle. What is our battle? Humility. That's a hard commodity to find. Because I'll tell you right now, you wouldn't believe how many times I've strutted around like a banny chicken, proud and arrogant, boastful. Throw your chest out and throw your brains away. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> an arrogant man is an ignorant man. I'm going to say it again. An arrogant man is an ignorant man. Once a man really begins to get a hold of some wisdom and understanding that this world right here will never be understood by one human being, it'll humble him. You get some smart aleck to think he has the answer to everything, you got an arrogant man and you got an ignorant man. And we're eating up with pride. We get up with it and go to bed with it. We carry it around. We talk about it. We do this. We do that. Pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Humble yourselves. The greatest thing to do, the greatest way to understand to humble yourself before God is to say, Lord, you're the Lord. I don't like what you're doing. I do it a different way. But there's nothing I can do about this but trust you. Trust you. So where did he get that from? When he bowed down there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed as it were great drops of blood, and he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He was not praying about dying on the cross. Take Hebrews chapter number 5 when you get home and read that. That's what he was praying about, was that judgment and wrath of God upon his soul. And he knew that was coming. You do that. You humble yourself. Secondly, you cast your care. We all got cares. We all got problems. Every one of us. You may be fine today. Thank God. You may be shouting this morning. Good. Shout on. Shout as much as you can shout. Enjoy the mountaintop. You live long enough, you'll understand that. Don't be jealous of people. If they're glorifying God and they're on the mountain, let them good, good night. Stay there. Shout. Over there in Israel, they've got what's called Mount Hermon. I was looking at the thing the other day. I watched it about 30, 45 minutes, Mount Hermon. They've got all these ski slopes up there. They've got snow on that thing. In June, July, these Jews are going up there and they're sliding, skiing all over the place. But the water from Mount Hermon goes into the Jordan River. It comes up at Benias. 
goes into the Jordan River, and the Jordan River snakes its way all the way down to the Dead Sea. And the Jordan River is a river of death. So you may be on the mountain. Hallelujah. But the water will come down. In other words, you'll have to live when you're not on the mountain. That's okay. That's, what, that's life. And I'm not up here to condemn you. But there'll be times you're not on the mountain. And you may get into a valley so deep, you didn't know any valley existed like that. You didn't know it. It could exist on earth. It didn't make any difference. He's God in the valley, and he's God on the mountain. The Bible says, resist the devil, and he'll flee from us. Resist him. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. See how it's all spiritual? Resist him in the faith. If you understand the faith, what is the faith? Here's what he said. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What's that mean? The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The word accomplished is the key to understanding that text. So what's that mean? That means that sin has an inevitable end. And the curse has an inevitable end. And that end is death. In plain words, you're living in a world that's cursed. And you're living in a world where death reigns. And so therefore, a Christian will experience the same suffering, same sorrow that the world does. Because you're living in the domain of death. And it will finish its course in you. This is what he said. The same afflictions are accomplished. Death will do its final stroke. It will accomplish what it intends to do. And therefore, Christians die with cancer. Christians die from this plague. Christians die from heart attacks. Christians die from strokes. Christians get killed in car wrecks. Christians get killed on the job. Christians get shot when somebody breaks into their house. They get murdered. Christians have the same thing happen to them that happens to the world. Because they're in the world, but they're not of the world. Aren't you glad that he's going to make a new one? A new heavens and a new earth. Father, bless your holy word. In the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Bless thee, dear folk. Help them. Lord, I'm up here to help people. I didn't come up here to kick them around, stomp them down, use them for cannon fodder. No, I came up here to help them. That's what I prayed before I got up here, Lord, you know that. I prayed for you to give me the words that I need to say to help some soul. And Lord, you know who's here. You know everything about everything. You know them all. I don't. I don't have to. All I need to do is to be submissive to your will and preach what you put on my heart. And you'll take it, and you'll minister it in thy holy name. And heads are bowed, nobody looking this morning. Because we've got people in here today that, that have lost loved ones, folks. We, John Maples, John Maples just passed away. John Maples passed away with COVID-19 Chinese plague. John was 63 years old. Just passed away. Just passed away. It's been a year of death. 2020 was a year of death. 2021 looks like it's starting out the same way. Amen. And I don't know, you might be here today and you've lost the dearest, nearest friend, loved one. Don't let Satan beat you to death. Don't let him rob you. Don't let him sift you. Head bowed. Anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher lost, don't you pray for me. Because I know that Satan's trying to destroy me. I know he's trying to devour me. God bless you. God bless you back here and over here. God bless you back here. See, God bless you. You don't know what people are carrying in their soul. You don't know their sorrows. We don't. That's arrogance on our part to think we understand everything that's going on inside the soul of a human being. No, we don't know that. But I would ask you to do this this morning. I'm going to have a prayer right here in a minute. And if you'd like to come down here and meet me on the altar, we're going to get down here and we're going to pray. I feel a need to do this. I hadn't planned on doing this, but I feel a definite need to do it this morning. Amen. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
Amen. Call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to pray. Maybe you'd like to come down here and pray with me. And we'll talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Come unto me, he said, cast your care upon me. Come unto me, all you that labor in a heavy laden. For I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest to your souls. Let's talk to him. My heavenly Father, Lord, I'm in a privileged position. I know that. I know it, Lord. I know it. I know it. If I know anything, I know it. Because you've put me here, Father, as a pastor. And you allow me to go see things other people don't see. You allow me to do that. You allow a lot of things to happen in my life. Father, I call upon thy holy name because I love you and I know you. I know you saved me. I know you wrote my name in heaven. And Father, I pray the Holy Spirit of God this morning. Lord, would come and move into the hearts of these dear people. The Holy Ghost, Lord, way past what I can do. The Holy Spirit, Lord, let him touch them. Let him move in their heart. Let him give them comfort. Let him give them life, our Heavenly Father. Let, let, him move, let him move in their soul, our Heavenly Father. Some of them needs to be, their joy needs to be restored. And some of them need to be forgiven. Some of them need to, you teach them the, the nature of this battle. That how they deal with their enemy. They know his wild, his tactics. And know when he's beginning to move in their soul and try to sift them. And then he's trying to overtake them and trying to consume them. Father, I pray for them. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, for thy people. We call on your name because you're the Lord. And there is none other. You love us. We love you. We know you. You know us. You know them. And my Father, there are many of these folk. I, probably most of them are saved down here. Some of them may not be. I don't know about the auditorium. Who am I? I don't know. But Father, I pray for every soul that hears this. And for those souls that are watching will watch it later. I pray for them. Once again, Lord, I'm in a privileged position. I know that, and I don't take it lightly. And I thank you for what you've done for me. And I bless your righteous name. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. We lift you up. You're our life. You're our hope. You're our future. You're what we're about. Lord Jesus, we have no hope, no life, no future, nothing without thee. Bless them. Touch them. Heavenly Father, touch these dear folk. Bless them in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.